maybe I can already start talking um, about what I'm going to tell you once my slides are up. Um, so I have already been introduced as the anti-L2 uh, uh, speaker. And this is not true. So I love L2s. I think L2s are a fantastic part of the solution of scaling Ethereum. Um, I just, basically, if you take home one message today, I want it to be L2s are not enough to scale the Ethereum verse. And this is, ah, oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So what I want to talk about today is the limitations and trade-offs that L2s come with. <clears throat> so um, maybe let's look at the history and genesis of L2s for a little bit. Um, it became clear pretty early on that Ethereum on its own was not going to scale, especially if, as it was envisaged at the time, and I still hope is going to come true, um, is that Ethereum is going to become the global settlement layer for the world. So, oops, now it's going too fast. No, it's in the wrong direction. Ah, fantastic. So, if you've been, if you've been in the space for a while, um, you know that we've talked about sharding forever. So back in the day, sharding was actually um, used to mean something different than what we think of sharding today. So back, back in the day, um, we were thinking of shards as these smart contract execution shards that could um, actually execute transactions on their own, not the data availability shards that are currently on the roadmap with dank sharding. And I think the uh, basically, the, the conclusion of this talk will be that this is kind of something that we kind of need to go back to, to kind of go to that vision of kind of interconnected shards to kind of scale the Ethereum ecosystem as a whole. So um, rollups um, became a uh, huge part of kind of scaling Ethereum pretty early on. Um, resources were poured into um, roll-ups, you know, to, to a very large extent. Um, and the ETH1 roadmap is now fully committed to scaling via layer twos. Since then, we've actually made some pretty significant technological advances. So we now have um, trustless ZK bridges between different EVM chains. Um, and maybe had we had them back in the day, or had we known that they would come way earlier than anyone would have thought possible, um, maybe this would have, uh, you know, uh, this would have unfolded somewhat differently. So this is talk about the limits of L2s and why we need more layer one block space also. OK, so layer twos at this point, they're securing billions of dollars, um, but mostly they're memes. <laughs> so in a way, um, they are because they are all mutable from a single multisig. And they have to be. And I can tell you why just a little bit later in the talk. Um, but basically, just the fact that they are mutable from a single multisig drives very much home the point that all the funds that are secured by those protocols are inherently at risk of um, compromised wallets. So there's also uh, the um, fraud proofs um, that are not operational in optimism at all um, and that are permissioned on Arbitrum. You probably know this. Um, shout out to the awesome guys at L2Beat. Um, so if you if you're interested in these kinds of um, details and how things actually work under the hood, um, they are a fantastic resource. I rely on them constantly. Cool. So a roll-up only architecture. So what are the shortcomings? Originally, roll-ups were meant to be liminal spaces. So um, the idea was that you would have, like, say, 100 transactions, and you would kind of, instead of settling them one by one on Ethereum mainnet, that you would kind of roll them together and then settle them on Ethereum as a roll-up. It's even, I mean, that's kind of where the name comes from, right? Um, so that works super well for some kinds of applications. So things like um, exchanges, futures exchanges, that works super well because basically you trade back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and in the end you kind of you have a single number that you kind of settle to L1. 
this is actually a fantastic instrument for scaling for many dApps. It doesn't work for all dApps. It depends on whether the state um, of the dApp itself kind of bloats um, or doesn't. So, um, for instance, like an exchange where you kind of trade back and forth and then you settle like a final number. Um, this is um, an example of where it works well. There's also examples of where it doesn't work well. So let's look at the limits to scalability. So you've probably seen this on Twitter. <laughs> it's made the round quite a few times in the, in the last months. So if you looked at Bitcoin and Lightning together, famously does not have sufficient bandwidth to even open um, a state channel for every human at birth and close it, you know, you know, after 80 years when they're presumably dead. So that's not, that's not, um, not, that's not even kind of possible um, as is now. So basically, which kind of very much um, drives home um, the limit of the scalability at the moment. Ethereum and layer twos aren't much better. So maybe let's do some back of the envelope maths. Ethereum currently has on the order of uh, 1.25 million um, transactions. Um, obviously depends on the kind of tra transactions. So this kind of varies a bit by day. But there's nothing on the roadmap, um, on the you know, core dev roadmap for the next say, three years or so, that will actually significantly change that number. <clears throat> so let's look at some examples. So ENS names. You all have an ENS name. But let's assume 10% of the world would actually want to register an ENS name for themselves. That's 800 million names. Um, and so if Ethereum did nothing else, nothing but actually register ENS names, and I'm not, talk I'm not talking about renewal fees or updating content or anything, or actually doing anything but ENS, it would still take two years to actually register all of these. Second example. <clears throat> There's currently 45,000 publicly listed companies in the world that you can trade. Um, if basically these were to be settled on Ethereum, despite, I mean, they can be traded on layer twos and so on. Um, but if you, you would probably have to have some settlement between brokers or movements, you know, between the different L2s, um, there, would, there would be less than 30 transfers per stock per day. Um, and this is not talking about, um, uh, that's not talking about, uh, I mean, basically all of these are you know, one or the other, right? So basically, would you do nothing but kind of settle these kinds of things. Also, the fees on layer twos, they rise in lockstep with fees on layer one. That's because the layer twos, inherently, they have to, um, they have to post transactions to layer one. That, that's kind of how they're designed, right? So basically, if L1 fees rise, L2 fees rise lockstep. So um, on layer twos for a regular transaction, currently the fees spike above a dollar um, regularly, and that's unacceptable for many use cases. This is going to get better by dank sharding, EIP 4844. Um, it will probably get like 90% cheaper, but that kind of, that gives you a factor of 10. Basically, if demand rises as it has in the past, a factor of 10 is nothing. So kind of we need more, we need more. <laughs> Okay, so second point, um, stuck users. So um, if the cost of actually exiting your layer two um, exceeds the value of the user's ass assets on that layer two, the user is, I mean, not technically, but economically stuck, right? And even if everyone could afford to pay to kind of um, uh, to offboard of the layer two back onto the layer one, um, not everyone could do it at the same time. It's kind of like trying to evacuate like a skyscraper, skyscraper through um, like a single fire exit door. So um, that kind of leads me to the next question. What kind of applications actually lend themselves to being rolled up? So there's many applications that don't actually. Now it's just going. I think I just have to speed up so I can keep up with my slides now. Um, so 
uh, there's actually many applications that don't lend itself uh, that don't lend themselves to being rolled up. One of them, for instance, is Circle's UBI. It's um, this decentralized web of trust uh, UBI. There's several hundred thousand accounts on. Uh, it's, it runs on Gnosis Chain. Um, there are several hundred thousand um, accounts, and basically that and all the trust connections, that's impossible to kind of compress and export to layer one. Um, another example is PoApp, um, that all of you are probably familiar with and kind of mint by the dozens. Um, also things like um, so social media apps, so for instance, Lens um, uh, wouldn't lend itself to kind of being off-border to L1 or um, things like um, your, even your NFT collection, to be honest. So now that actually leaves us at a point where for many, many things, it's actually unfeasible to ever exit the layer two. So basically, you, you kind of, you choose um, to live your life on an L2. So it's become a permanent space. It's no longer liminal space. Um, so there was this, uh, this uh, tweet by Ansgar, basically roll-up-centric roadmap summarized. You will live in an L2, you will consume the blobs, and you will do nothing on L1, and you will be happy. And I think that's currently the vision that, um, or the way that it works on many L2s. But I would argue that for that, the cost of actually being on an L2 is too large um, compared to um, uh, being on another L1. Okay, another point, centralized sequences. Sorry, guys. Um, so currently, um, all layer two solutions currently have centralized sequences. I don't know whether people kind of understand generally how important that is to appreciate, that means that exactly one entity is allowed to actually build blocks. So the level of decentralization is literally zero. Um, the, all layer twos kind of planned to get to you know, a decentralized sequencer eventually, but right now it's not. Right now it's literally one single entity building blocks. So um, this is, I don't want to knock Coinbase because basically they've been, they've been battered enough for the last couple of months, um, but, and I think basically moving um, kind of in the uh, more decentralized realm with base, I think that was a great move for Coinbase, but I think it has to be um, said um, that obviously Coinbase controls the centralized sequences, and it, it, it um, is always kind of a party that can um, guarantee its own applications and its own um, order books priority over others, right? So basically there's like the, the, the central idea of kind of building things on blockchain is to, to a certain extent um, that everyone's the same and this is very much not um, the case on L2s at the moment. We can also see this here. So this is actually not an L2. This is Ethereum mainnet. <clears throat> and you can see um, the OFAC compliant blocks over the last half year or so. Um, and you can see that basically at some point there were like in excess of you know, 85% or so um, that were OFAC compliant and effectively would, would censor transactions just because um, the, uh, the relayer that people used um, the Flashbots relayer um, kind of was built that way. So this has gone down over time because they have, they ha the uh, repos were open sourced and a couple of people kind of launched their own relayers that don't censor. So there's um, Agnostic Relay by Justin Drake and our own, um, uh, sorry, Agnostic Relay by us and, uh, and Ultrasound Relay by Justin Drake. <clears throat> so basically it's gone down to like 27% again. But even on Ethereum kind of there are um, the veil of, of decentralization can be thin. So even, and I'm pretty sure the Flashbots people, they didn't, set up, they didn't want to censor um, any transactions. It was their lawyer that told them, dudes, you, 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 you got to do this or you, know, you risk whatever. And um, uh, so basically at the end of the day, it kind of came down to the decision of that one lawyer and that kind of led to 85% of Ethereum blocks being um, in principle, censored. 
OK, so let's talk about L1s. Um, so bridges between L1s and L2s are fantastic. This is why people love them, right? <clears throat> But if you appreciate that most of the assets that live on L2s are natively issued um, on L2s um, and are not bridged over from Ethereum, um, this, is, this kind of this security advantage, advantage goes away, right? So basically, if you have an alternate layer one and you mint assets there, they are just as secure, almost just as secure, just by running your own node or kind of trusting that the services you use run their own node. So basically, this is something that kind of gets repeated a lot, that, L2, uh, that other L1s are inherently less secure um, because they have a smaller validator set and so on. But basically, if, you, if there's a way for you to kind of be a full node yourself, this is not true. So basically, um, if you run your own full node um, on another layer one, um, you, uh, uh, nothing can be taken away from you. So um, on Gnosis, for instance, the natively asset, uh, issued assets are um, circles that I talked about earlier, um, Monarium, which is a euro stable kind, USDC issues on many chains, on many other L1s natively, backed issues, tokenized stocks, and real world assets. And, um, there's only going to be more of those. OK. The other thing is kind of the state of Ethereum and how it's still evolve, evolving. And we, we don't want um, it to stop evolving. But basically, as long as Ethereum evolves, um, layer twos will have to have upgrade rights, right? So they cannot be immutable because it's possible that things happen on layer one, where basically that will break things on layer two, right? So one example of this, um, okay, this is um, from uh, Danny Ryan. So basically he talked about the ossification of Ethereum and basically he predicted that Ethereum was gonna change significantly still in the next five to 10 years. So um, <clears throat> one example is Snapshot X, which is Snapshot on StarkNet. Um, so basically, if Ethereum goes to vertical trees, Snapshot is on, on, on StarkNet is going to break. So you need upgrade rights for StarkNet to kind of make sure that you still have um, governance. OK, so what's the solution? As I said, <clears throat> Layer twos, we, we need them, right? This is, it's not, this is not an anti-L2 talk. It's an L2 plus talk. So we need more. OK. <clears throat> so um, what we kind of envisage at Gnosis um, is kind of to have um, s s several, many Ethereum-like chains that, can, that kind of have the same execution and consensus layer um, architecture as Ethereum and can have trust minimized bridges between the consensus layers. So um, the ZK bridges, um, the ZK light client bridges, that's something that's new. Basically, I think the first uh, proof of principle um, was deployed last year between Gurley and Gnosis. Um, and uh, basically, it's um, cryptographically secure br bridging. <clears throat> OK. Um, obviously, bridges always come with different risks. So, um, and if you look at bridge hacks over the last, say, year and a half or something, it's kind of in excess of $4 billion that have been hacked. Obviously, th that is not a great state of affairs. So what we think needs to happen is we think there needs to be an inter-Ethereum protocol. Um, we have built something to kind of um, try to get, to, uh, get there. It's called Hashi. Hashi means bridge in Japanese. And what it does is it's, in effect, it's a bridge aggregator. So basically, it looks at um, the block headers as relayed by different bridges. And it only lets you bridge if all block headers agree. So basically, as compared to using a bridge singly, um, it adds a little bit of over a gas overhead. Um, but basically, you have the additive security um, afforded to you by several bridges who may have different mechanisms, different implementations, and so on. So somewhat disparagingly, kind of, I would say it's a little bit like having a sieve and a sieve and a sieve. If you put enough sieves you know, it, into each other, then uh, you, you end up with something that is super secure by additive 
security. Um, in a way, this, is, this would be equivalent um, to what Cosmos has. Um, in Cosmos, it's called the IBC. Fantastic. Good. Um, so the um, IBC kind of trustlessly connects different um, Cosmos chains. And the Inter-Ethereum protocol can do the same for um, Ethereum chains, um, kind of fulfilling this smart chart vision that we had like five or so years ago. Um, so <clears throat> to summarize, L2s leverage the decentralization that the L1, Ethereum, already has. And that's fantastic. So L2s are fantastic tools for many, many things. Um, but we cannot stop investing in, decentral in decentralization and kind of producing credibly neutral and resilient block space. So that's kind of what we're doing. Um, so if you look at the decentralization stats here, um, Ethereum currently has um, 574,000 validators, um, and Gnosis has 122. So that's kind of like 20% of what Ethereum has. Um, how, how did we get there? So we actually made it as easy as humanly possible to kind of become a validator on Gnosis chain. So first of all, the capital requirements are much lower. So on, so on Ethereum, you need 32 ETH, which is you know, in excess of $50,000. Um, and on Gnosis chain, you need one GNO. That's $100. You can run it on almost any hardware that you don't switch off. Um, we, um, uh, we incentivize validators um, in regions where we are underrepresented. So there's Gnosis VIP. You can look it up at gnosisvip.com. Um, so if um, I, I looked it up earlier, and Montenegro is actually currently unclaimed. So we have um, validators in 76 countries as opposed to Ethereum's 82. Um, and our goal is to get to one validator per country. So basically, if you set up and um, reliably run a Gnosis validator in Montenegro, you can claim your reward for that. So, but, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't actually want to go for wood. <clears throat> so, um, but what I, what I kind of want to drive home is basically currently we have 120,000 validators on Gnosis chain. So basically for most intents and purposes, that is plenty decentralization. Um, so, it's 2023, and you're deciding where to deploy a DAP. So there's definitely pros and cons of kind of <laughs> all the different venues you can deploy, right? And I think questions you kind of um, uh, you have to ask yourself is, how much does my offering suffer from platform risk? So if that is a lot, you kind of you don't want to go to something to a solution where you're at the mercy of a single entity or their lawyer. <clears throat> how much do you care about credible neutrality? Um, how important is moving between Ethereum and um, your DAP? That's kind of the thing that really L2 still have a lack up. So basically, the bridges between L1s and L2s are more secure than the ones between different L1s, so the Inter-Ethereum protocol. Um, I would argue that the Inter-Ethereum protocol, and basically, find me anywhere. I'll be here until Tuesday. I'm super happy to talk about Hashi and the Inter-Ethereum protocol. Um, this is not a talk about it. But um, yeah, it's, I, uh, I think kind of we've made, we've moved in leaps and bounds um, in terms of progress for Inter-L1 bridging. Um, do you rely on third-party liquidity? Where's that liquidity? Do you rely on other dApps? Um, and what's the transaction price point that your, um, that your DAP is economically viable at? Okay, so uh, where to find out more? We're DAO, so basically come to our forum um, and kind of just participate um, in the discussion. We have DevDocs. Um, you can look at the chain stats. So as you can tell, decentralization is something that is near and dear to my heart. So um, kind of we have to make sure that Gnosis chain is, you know, is credibly neutral and, and uh, resilient. Um, and become a validator. OK, we also, we're also hiring. So if you are looking for a job, please come seek us out. And um, just a very um, quick uh, 
as every year, we are um, organizing a conference in Berlin during Berlin Blockchain Week this year called DAFCON. It's in September. Um, and ticket sales are going live soon. Um, and speaker applications are already open. Cool. Thank you so much.